Praise God. Praise God. We love you, Lord. We love you.
I don't get all the stuff. Yeah. But, you know, anyway. I'm just saying. They, they have this thing now where they're wanting them to be able to play women's sports. <laughs> I'm yeah. saying, come on. Uh, even Bruce Jenner, who is now somebody else, yeah. said that it was unfair. Because you can change, you can give a man breasts or you can give him a vagina, I suspect, and do other things. But it's physiologically, it's still a guy. He still has the muscle, the, ten, the tone, the bone structure, and so forth of a man. So you're then pitting that person against girls and women, and it's not fair. Right. No. And that's coming from one of their own that said that, and also many others have said the same thing. It's just not right. I mean, okay, you want to do that. That's your business. You can do it if you want to, but that doesn't give you the right then to come in and be able to dominate in a sport that you really have no business participating in. That's my feeling. You can send me all the hate mail you want. I couldn't care less. I'm not interested in it, but I'm just saying. I agree. That's just something. You want to do that? That's fine. That's, you can do whatever you want to do, but you can't use that then as a, a means to overpower somebody else or use it to manipulate a, a sport or whatever. Right. Well, they said, and this is the reason for bringing it up in the first place, is they said there were people of faith. There were faith groups who were fighting against this ability to let these transgender men participate in women's sports. And I'm thinking, who in the world, what faith group could that be? Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I mean, maybe I'm nuts, but I'm thinking, how could some group that's supposedly God, believers, and, and Christians see that that wouldn't be right? Couldn't, how they could not understand that. Well, then they showed a couple of them. <laughs> And they had the, the outfit, you know, the backward uh, collar. And one was a woman and another was a guy. Uh, and so they, I don't know what organization they're with or what, you know. <laughs> but I thought, you know what, there's a perfect example. And I'll say this to, uh, to Mike. Gerlach. A uniform doesn't make a soldier. True. You can dress up like anything you want to, but that doesn't make you what you're claiming to be. Yeah. And so that's the first thing that came to my mind when I saw him. I thought, oh, yeah, that's a good-looking outfit. That looks really spiritual. But you haven't got a clue yeah. what you're believing in. Nope. nope. You might as well be wearing a, you know, a Bozo the Clown outfit. <laughs> Sorry, but that's just how much that represents when all of your ideologies are so skewed and twisted. I don't care what you dress up like. You put all the robes and gowns and garb that you want on, and you're still missing the mark here. That's me. That's my opinion. And so far in this country, we still have a right to it, whether they like it or not. But that's just how I feel about it. So the reason I said that was, Something that was said on whatever show that was I was watching reminded me of when we lived in Texas. They always had these little Texas kind of things, sayings. And one of them was, all hat and no cattle. <laughs> and that just reminded me immediately of those people or religion in general. Yeah. Yeah. Looked apart, got the big hat, got the sets and been walking around with you know, the boots and everything else, but they don't have a cow. Right. They're not a cowboy, they're just pretend, their makeup, they're, they got the outfit, but that's all they got. Amen? That's religion. But here is us. This is us. Christians. Real Christians. A bent stick with a straight lick. <laughs> we're not perfect. We're twisted. We're bent. We're, we're, but we, when we strike, we strike a straight lick. It's, it's, it's clear. It's understandable where we're coming from and what it is we're trying to do. We're not, we're not perfect. None of us in the right mind would claim to be. We're flawed. We are that bent stick. But if we're operating in faith, we're going to strike a straight lick. It's going to be right on the way God wants it to be. And that's the world we live in today. A lot of people running around with big hats and no cattle. And a lot of other people that they're just pointing out the bent sticks. But watch it when they strike. It'll be a straight lick every time. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Amen. So that's my, my share. Amen. Hallelujah. That's the most I got out of whatever that show was that I watched. Praise God. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 4. That we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is in Christ. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, Make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the, uh, their, the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them, because of the blindness in their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over into lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ, if so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Praise the Lord. You know, uh, there's no question that... Uh, Satan tried to destroy the church of Jesus Christ at its very inception. So it shouldn't surprise us today that he would try to attack and victimize the church as we get closer and closer to the return of the Lord. The devil knows if he is going to do damage to God's plan, he's got to do it quickly. He hasn't much time left. And so it's clear that the early church had to contend with a, a lot of demonic attacks. But just like the early church rose up in the power Amen. of the Spirit to meet the challenge, we will also conquer. Amen. And greater than those shall we be in the end. Amen. Because it's going to take greater. Praise God. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4. Thank the Lord. All half. I love that. <laughs> For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world. Even our faith. Yes. Yep. Praise the Lord. Verse 19 and 20. And we know that we are God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. I'm going to get an amen. amen. And we know that the Son of God has come, and hath given us an understanding that we may know him that is true. And we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. I'm just, I, as usual, I'm using a lot of scriptures, but that's because I don't, this is not just something, this isn't my twist on it, you know? I'm just saying what the Word of God Amen. says. Cool. And that way, it, everybody can search the scriptures for themselves and see if, it, if, if it's God or if it's just me, me dreaming something up, right? <laughs> for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Mm-hmm. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down the strongholds. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now it's interesting here that five times the words war and warfare are used in the New Testament. War or warfare, five different times. But they're not used in connection with the devil. Both times here in 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 10, verses 3 through 5, is speaking of mental bondages. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's talking about things within our own thinking that have to be pulled down, yeah. that have to be battled against. 
things that are contrary to the word of God. Look at James chapter 4 and verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Mm -hmm. So here, war is used again. And this time it's to describe the flesh, not the devil, our mind, our way of thinking, and the way we act as a result of that. Amen? The warfare is fighting fleshly lust. Amen? Or you could, the, another uh, translation is minds reasoning or reasonings of the mind. Mm -hmm. Rational, so-called thinking, right? Mm -hmm. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Mm -hmm. Again, we think when we say lust, we, tend, we have a tendency to think of, you know, lusting after a woman or after some physical thing. That's not what the language is being used here. That's not the way it's talking. It's talking about letting your minds cause you to behave in a certain way. Letting the way you think cause you to react or act in a certain way. That is at odds with your spirit. Okay? So again, he's describing the flesh attempting to conquer or subdue the mind or to try to get the mind to work according to the flesh rather than in agreement with the spirit. Amen? Amen. So, yeah, the devil will do that. But most of the time, it's us. It's, it's what we're subjecting ourselves to. It's what we're putting ourselves, uh, being influenced by, in other words. Amen? And so the mind, and, and, and he's going to attack but, and, and try to work against us. But here's what the scripture is telling us. If we keep our mind in tune with the Holy Spirit or in control of the, by the Holy Spirit, most of the warfare is settled already. We don't even have to deal with it. We don't even have to get into a battle with it. We don't have to, to you know, go out and struggle with it. Right. It's about getting our minds in sync with our spirit. And I've said this many times, but in the Marine Corps, they had that saying. You, need, you know, if you screwed up something, if you didn't do it right, I know Dan can uh, cooperate this. Get your head and the other end wired together so that you work the way you're supposed to work. So your thinking and your actions are in tune with one another, right? And so that's basically what God is saying in, a, in a, obviously a much nicer way. Get your thoughts and your spirit in sync. Right. Then you'll be successful. Whether it's you that you're struggling with, your own imaginations and reasonings, or if it's the world around you, or the devil himself. Amen? Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 11. Dearly, uh, let us therefore, uh, let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So here he's given us the real goal. The real goal that we have in life isn't to fight for deliverance, but it's to freely accept our deliverance that Jesus already purchased for us. We're, we're getting into a lot of battles that aren't even our battles, that we shouldn't even have to be dealing with. Amen? He, we're supposed to freely accept the deliverance that has been obtained by Jesus for us. Yes. I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to get up and, and you know, get the sword and all the stuff, get ready to weapon. And I'm not saying there isn't a time when you have to put on the, 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 the armor, but I'm saying for the most part, it's simply us getting sucked into things that are, that are really not, that have nothing to do with us. We have been redeemed. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. We're not struggling to overcome the enemy so that we can be accepted by God. We are accepted by God. That's where our authority and our power is. And that's really the reason why the enemy attacks us. He isn't attacking the morons out here that are doing all the sick and crazy stuff. Right. That's not the, the devil isn't attacking them. He's going, come on, they're on our side. Work with them. It's the people who oppose the demonic that are under attack. Amen? And a lot of that attack is because we're putting ourselves in a position where we feel fearful or threatened when in fact we're not at all. The enemy knows he's whipped. He's a defeated foe. He just tries to convince us through our own thinking and through the things around us that we, that we have to battle somehow to, to overcome. No, Jesus already overcame. 
He is the overcomer. And that's how we become more than overcomers, is by simply resting in what Jesus has already done for us. That's the thing we have to constantly remind ourselves, and it's one of the things God has been dealing with me about, is stop struggling with all this stuff. What do you think my sacrifice was for? I wasn't looking... You know, he's telling me, I, I wasn't looking for a medal. I wasn't looking for a parade. I was looking to set you free so you don't have to fight anymore. Yeah. Yes. Praise the Lord. Jesus finished the redemptive work. And if we understand that, that is truly walking by faith. Walking by faith is simply saying, it's done. Yes. I don't have to do anything anymore. Amen. I just have to confirm or affirm what he has already yeah. accomplished. Yeah. Amen. Amen. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 3. I think, you know, God is telling us we're doing a lot of struggling that we shouldn't be struggling with. It's, you know, there are some things we're going to have to battle. But a lot of it is just self-imposed stuff that we're just putting on ourselves because we don't recognize this is a defeated foe we're dealing with. Yeah. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us and look at this, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. He's, here's what Paul is saying. Don talked about this. Him struggling in this battle and so on and so forth. And he's telling us, Paul, that same man who said, I, I, I have won the race. I have run the race. Amen. I have finished my course. Amen. But he says here, the reason for that was, and I'm trying to get you to have the same victory, it's a result of having fellowship with God. And with his, the manifest presence of him in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes, amen. That fellowship is what he wants us to follow. And if we're going to pursue something, let's pursue fellowship with God because that's where the victory is. Amen. That's where our confidence will come from. Amen? Yes. Our Heavenly Father wants to fellowship with us. That's a hard thing for me. I mean, that's been difficult for me. In some ways, it was easier when I was in a Pentecostal environment where I had to fast, where I had to do, I had to self-discipline. And it, it wasn't that I was perfect. It just made me feel more like I was, I had a part in this thing, you know, I'm doing this. Only to see myself fail and then wonder, okay, now what are you going to do? You're gonna, you, you know, that 10-day that fast didn't work. You ready for a 20? Amen. Sally, I tell you, I did. I, I, but when I go and pray for people, I go and fast to where I passed out in the hallway of the hospital from not eating for what, whatever it was. And the young man that I was praying for died. Because I thought it was about me. I thought it was, if I do enough, I'll have power. When God said, the power comes from what I have already done. And you're resting in that. You're acknowledging that it is God and not me. He wants to commune. He wants to communicate with us. That's the real focus of Scripture. It's really about God wanting us, wanting to be one with us, wanting to connect with us. And that's where the victory is. Fellowship that Paul talks about here is impossible if we can't hear God. If we can't hear him talk. If we can't talk to him believe that he's talking to us. Fellowship is not existent. You can have a, uh, an acknowledging of God, an awareness of God, but you don't have intimacy. You don't have fellowship. Imagine, just think about this. The other night, I was thinking about this early in the morning. Imagine somebody calls you claiming to be your spouse. Even if they had the same voice, the same accent, the same speech patterns. It still wouldn't be too hard to tell which one was really your wife or husband. <laughs> now, my daughter, Allison, every once in a while she'll call and I'll pick it up. And if her and, and Sally are out shopping or doing something together, I'll think it's Sally. Because they sound enough alike, especially on the phone. But it doesn't take long before Allison will say something that I know, okay, Sal, that's, that's Allison. Not stuff stupid, it's just they don't have the same, you know, the conversations are just different between Allison and I and Sally and I. And I can pick it up. I, the first couple of three words, 
I'll think, okay, Sally, is that you? And then she'll say, this is Allison. But even if she didn't say that, I would know because of the way the conversation goes, the way it goes forward. Amen? So a man would know his wife based on the content of the conversation. Right? right? Wouldn't take long before the conversation would get to a place where you'd go, okay, this, that's, that's not Jane. You know, that's not Sally. That's, you know, that's not Sheila. That's somebody that sounds like him, but that's not them, right? A wife, see, she could ask some questions mm -hmm. and answer questions that no other woman could ask or answer. Amen? She could use vocabulary that is distinctly hers, mm -hmm. that only she uses. Amen? A man, it wouldn't take long for a man to know that that's my wife. Amen? And it wouldn't take long, likewise, for a woman to be able to recognize her husband's voice the same way. Just because of the way they talk, the way they communicate. Not the sound, but the content. Right? It's the same way with the Lord. The conversations that we have with him come out of relationship. Amen? They come out of the relationship. He knows things about me nobody else knows. Amen? Amen? Do you know what God would talk to you about? It's really knowing what God would talk about more than the sound of his voice. Mm -hmm. We know God's voice by the content of what he says. Mm -hmm. How many know the devil would like you to believe <clears throat> he's God sometimes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. But I'll tell you what. When God talks, he talks about the way he talks about himself would be an indication that it's God. Mm -hmm. Or about situations where I need guidance. Mm -hmm. I'd know if it was the Lord. If he's telling me, yeah, go punch him out or get a gun or something, I know that ain't God. <laughs> right? right? I'm not saying those thoughts wouldn't come, but I know it, that's not God talking. Mm -hmm. Amen? Or, or he talked about himself in reference to Scripture. No, it's, he's talking about himself because I've seen him in the Word. I've seen that. I've seen where he expressed himself that way. Or how he talks about sin. Sin comes, and the thought is, oh my God, I'm such a failure. I'm such a. That's not God. God doesn't know I have ever sinned. He cast my sin as far as the east is from the west. He does not remember. He has the capacity to not remember my sin. Amen. So when somebody's talking to me in my mind or in my spirit about sin, it ain't God. It's either my own confused reasoning or it's the enemy trying to get me oppressed and depressed so I won't have the, the, the courage or the fortitude to step up and do what God is trying to get me to do because right. I feel like a failure. Or he'll talk to me about myself, as I said, because he knows things about me that nobody else knows. Right. <clears throat> or he talked to me about relating to others. How many of you... You know, sometimes you'll say, you know, that's just, you know, you need to not do that. Yeah. And I know it isn't me because I think, yeah, I need to do that every once in a while just to keep the record straight. You know, just to, yeah. you know, keep everybody on the right page. No, it's God when he says, you know, that's a waste of time and all you're doing is creating a bigger problem. Sometimes David said, set a watch on my tongue. Man, I'll tell you, I, I, I have to do that a lot. And sometimes... I think God's distracted <laughs> because crap comes out of my mouth in a moment, you know, in the moment of oh, yeah. a situation that I, oh, God, you know, I just know this isn't going to help at yeah. all, you know. Or when he talks about faith, that's God talking. I know when it's God talking. And then why does, why does he talk to me that way? So that his desire for me will happen increasingly more often. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's what he's after. That's what his conversations are usually about. About blessing me. About getting me to the place where I'm not dealing with all of the <clears throat> day in, day out crap that we deal with simply because we're not aware of his presence. Mm -hmm. We're not conscious of his being so one with us. Look at John chapter 5, 39 and 40. Search the 
scriptures. For then, in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. Now that scripture, I mean we all read it all the time. Of course we can relate it to the Pharisees. But think about the religious world today. Just think about those people that I'm talking about that believe you know, some of these ministers are homosexuals themselves. I'm not, I'm not hateful to homosexuals. I'm just saying there's a better way, that God has a, has a better plan and a purpose. And I'm not, I'm not wanting to, you know, demonize that. But on the other hand, how can they search the scriptures yeah. and not find the truth? Right. Jesus. They're reading the same book, mm -hmm. if they're reading it. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? you got to know the voice of God. Because you can have the same information and be hearing something altogether different. Yeah. And I know the argument will be, well, how do you know it's the Lord? <coughs> because he has testified to it. Yes. Over yeah. and over yes. and over. Yes. Praise the Lord. Search, search the scriptures. You search them, and, and you think in them you have eternal life, but they're the ones that are talking about me and what I have declared and what I believe and what, what I stand for, mm -hmm. but you won't come to me. You want your own agenda. You've got your own game. Mm -hmm. yep. You won't come to me so that you can have life, God life, eternal life. In Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus talks about the importance, the important and the necessity of hearing God speak. <clears throat> what the Spirit is saying. Not just the words on the page, but what is the Spirit saying to us? And we've talked about this already this morning. We've talked about it many times, and all of us know it. It's that fresh word. It's the same word that everybody reads, and we've read hundreds and hundreds of times, and all of a sudden the Spirit speaks to us through that same word. It quickens us. The Spirit is life. The Word, the Spirit brings life to the Word of God. Makes it God's voice. Makes it God speak. Amen. John 10, uh, verse, verse 4. John 10, verse 4. When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Think about Psalms. 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I know his voice. I follow him. Maybe, maybe you're a little erratic at times. But I follow him. And if I get distracted, he'll come after me if I'm the only one. He'll leave the 99. Yep. Come get me and get me back into the fold. Hallelujah. That's the shepherd. Yes. That's our good shepherd. Yes. Hallelujah. In verse 16. Other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Now when Jesus was talking before the scripture we just read a moment ago about you search the scriptures and you look for me, you're looking for the voice but you don't even know who I am. He was talking about other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. This fold was the, the Jews yeah. where, that he came to initially. Them also I must bring. But I have that are not of this fold. That's us. Yes. This, is the, this is the dividing line of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. now Jesus, we haven't entered into it, but he's talking about it to them. He's letting them know what, he's, what his purpose is. And so he's saying, there's, there's, there's another covenant coming. Yes. They're not in this covenant, mm -hmm. but they have a covenant. They will have a covenant. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Oh, How? By them all hearing the voice. Yes. Not because of their religion, not because they're Jews. He said there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there's no male or female. It's just believers. There's just those that hear his voice and follow him. Praise the Lord. Verse 16, guys. So, 15 times in the New Testament, he says, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Praise the Lord. And the last seven times that he says that is in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And there Jesus adds to that what the Spirit is saying. Praise the Lord. And that's because Jesus was speaking from the Holy Spirit here on earth. Amen. Amen. He wasn't speaking.
speaking anymore physically to people. He was speaking via the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Listen, Jesus, Jesus defined his followers as those who hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Think about this. There was a time when Jesus told them blood family. Now, I know we're all of the same. We've been born again of the blood, so we have that now. But there was a time prior to this, that first, that first uh, fold. Amen? And there was a big crowd there, and his mother, his birth mother, and his birth brothers were there, and they said, tell Jesus we want to see him. We need to talk to him. Right? They wanted, to, they wanted to get a hold of him. They, but there was a huge crowd there. And so they sent this message and said, we want, to, we want to speak to Jesus. And so he turns their request into this demonstration of the importance of hearing God. And he does it by describing the members of his physical birth family, he says, as those who hear the word of God. Not the one that, that, that birthed me from her womb. Not the brothers that I share a father with. But those who hear my voice. Yes. That's who he described as his birth family. Amen? Look at Luke chapter 8, verse 21. And he answered, he said unto them, My mother and my brethren are these which hear the word of God and do it. That's my family. That's who I identify with. Is that, is that powerful or not? Well, we know he loved his mother. But Jesus told us, he said, we are to live the way he lived. We are supposed to minister the way he ministered. And we thought that to be, religiously speaking, of being, you know, a monk, uh, somebody who's, you know, just cut off from everybody in the world so that you don't sin. You don't contact with anybody, then you don't have to worry about making mistakes. Only that Jesus already told us is the thoughts are as bad as the actions. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So look at John chapter 12 and verse 49. For I have not spoken of myself. This is Jesus talking about his ministry, the way he lives, the way he operates. He said, I don't talk about myself. But the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're supposed to minister as he ministered. We're supposed to live as he lived. Yes. How was that? By observing the Father, hearing what the Father says, and doing what the Father does. Yes. Amen? Amen? John 12, 49. That was John 12, 49. Sorry. He told Martha... The same thing. Remember, uh, Mary's sitting at Jesus' feet, and Martha's ranting and raving because I'm doing all the cooking and cleaning, and she's sitting in there listening to you. And what did Jesus say? She's doing the one thing that's important. Yes. Thank you, Martha, for the meal. Thank you, Martha, for your hard work. But I'm telling you, what she's doing is what's necessary, and that's to hear God. Amen? Amen. One of the strongest uh, teachings in the New Testament is that God, the Holy Spirit, lives in us today yes. as believers. Yes. And yet we talk very little about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, religion itself does. But that's the most important thing that he's trying to get across to us. You, we are one. Just as Jesus said, I and my Father are one. We have the same, the very same condition. We're one with him. Then it only stands the reason we should be hearing what he's saying and doing what he's doing. That's how Jesus was successful. That's how Jesus was able to do what he did. Because even though he was God in the flesh, he operated simply as a man connected to God by the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And the reason for that, the reason for God to be one with us is to be to us everything Jesus was to the disciples. Amen? Amen? It's one of his greatest promises. I'll lead you. I'll guide you. I'll teach you. I'll, I'll show you how to do this. What did he do with the disciples? 
He blessed them. He, the Holy Spirit on them and said, now go. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. And they did. And what did they say? Man, never knew we could do this. You can't, you moron. It's the Jesus on you that's doing this. Yes. It's the connection he has made with you. Praise the Lord. Well, you probably didn't say that. But I'm still flawed. Amen. Been sick, right? Remember? Amen. John 14, verse 16. I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. And then he explains even more. The helper, he says, is the spirit of truth. Uh, verse 17 and 18. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, because he dwells with you and shall be in you, which he now is. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yes, Lord. And then he gives an even stronger statement. That last little phrase. I'm going to send the spirit of truth to you. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. i got to go away so I can send him to him. And then what does he say? I will come to you. Yes. I am the spirit of truth. I am the spirit of God. Yes. Yes. I am God coming to man. Yes. And I will come to you by the spirit. I'll be one with you. I'll be you. I'll be in you. Amen? Yes. Praise the Lord. That's what he's done. I mean, imagine if we could stay conscious of that. It's so easy for us to, I mean, I know me. It's so easy for me in the heat of a situation to just, I mean, lose track of everything. But if I could maintain that awareness, oh, how things would be different. How things would have been different in my life, not to mention how they could still be. Yes. And that's what God is asking. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It's expedient for you that I go away. Because if I don't go away, he could say it this way, I won't be able to come back in the spirit. But if might physically go away, I'll send him to you. That means that everybody now can have that spirit dwelling within them. Not just Jesus with a group of people, but Jesus in each one of us individually. Amen? Yes. See, that's what he's trying to get us to understand. The norm, the Christian norm, is to walk by faith. That's normal. That should be normal. Yes. Because that's what Jesus did. Everything he did, he did by faith. Including the crucifixion. Romans 8, 4. Just give you three quick scriptures here. But look at this. Romans 8, verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Think of that. Keeping all of the law is fulfilled in us. Yes. Right? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Yes. As far as God's concerned, we kept all the law. Yes. Something that only one man ever did. And that man was God himself. Praise the Lord. 1 John 2, 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abideth in you. It lives in you. The anointing. Christ is the anointed one. Right? It's not just something. It's a someone. And that anointing is in us. Lives in us. Abides in us. Or lives in us. So you need not that any man teach you. Now get this. If we were operating the way we should, you don't need me. You don't need anybody. You've got the teacher. You've got the yes. professor of professors. You've got the one who wrote the book for crying out loud. Come on. Amen. And you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. Think about it. In heaven, you won't, you, you won't be having to have a teacher. Because everything you already know will be a conscious reality. James 1, 5 through 8. 
Here's the problem. James identifies it. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Ask him, and he'll give it to you. He won't ridicule you because you don't know. He'll give it to you because he wants you to know. Amen? But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let that, that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. The double-minded man, man is the guy we were talking about back in Corinthians, who is, uh, who has the Spirit of God, but he's operating from his natural way of thinking, and so he's fighting against himself. Double-minded. You can't get anything from God that way because God only responds to faith. Yes. Right. And faith has to be in what he has said, not in what we're seeing. Yes. Or not in what somebody else is saying. Yes. Praise the Lord. The scriptures are the, look, look, listen, scriptures, the Bible itself, are, is the only objective revelation. They're only objective revelations as the Holy Ghost makes them so. And we know that to be true, otherwise we wouldn't have all these conflicting beliefs. Right, yeah. So the scriptures are only objective when the Holy Spirit makes them that way. Amen. Without the Holy Spirit, you don't know what to believe. Right. You're dependent on some other clown who doesn't know themselves. Right. How many are, are theology professors in our universities who have not the Spirit of God, they're not born again, they have not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they're teaching the Word of God? Yeah. They're teaching subjective truths. Right. And that truth is the scripture. And man himself, without the Holy Spirit, becomes subjective revelation. Yeah. Right. In other words, that means that each individual thinks whatever they want to think it means. Yeah. That's the difference between truth and fallacy. Either the Holy Spirit is quickening and making it tr the, the Word of God to you, or without it, it's just subjective. It's just whatever you choose to believe. And that's why we've got every kind of weirdo out here claiming to be people of faith, people of God, who are just taking the Scriptures and subjectively using them to fit whatever their own mindset is or whatever their, the, the culture is demanding. <clears throat> That's not objective. That's subjective. That's you just making a choice. You know, I don't want to believe that because, you know, it would conflict with my neighbor who happens to be something that they're not. Right? It would, it would cause me to be, you know, have problems with the government. Yeah. You know, they, they, they don't want me to say anything that doesn't agree with their subjective choices. And, and you know it's subjective because you can get a different response from 50,000 people that all give you a different response answer. And they're all true because they have a right to believe whatever they want. Yes, they do have a right to believe whatever they want to, but they don't have a right to make me have to believe it. Yeah. Praise the Lord. John 16 and 13. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, what we're talking about right now, he'll guide you into all truth. Because he's not going to talk about himself. But whosoever he shall hear, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. In other words, yes. he's not a, a, an entity of himself. Yes. He's only saying what God has said. He's only saying what the Spirit of God has always said. Amen? Praise the Lord. Look, all I'm, try all I'm trying to say is we need this relationship. We need this intimacy. We need... We need this understanding of God in order to hear Him. Yes. Otherwise, we're subject to every lunatic and halfwit running around out here with a backwards collar or whatever their get-up is, if they have one at all, who just claims to be a spokesman for the Lord, who claim to be people of faith. Right. Faith in what? In your government? I, I you know... There was a time I had faith in government because it was based on a covenant that this government had with God. That these people yeah. that the government is supposed to represent had a covenant with God. Right. 
Now, many of the people still have this covenant, but the government is far from operating under that covenant because they no longer serve the people. They serve their own agenda, their own subjective plan or idea of what they think it should be and what they want it to be. They don't represent me. It's like the guy in New York. He, he walking this wealthy, dressed up guy, fancy looking suit, and he's walking through the park, and this guy comes up and sticks a gun in his face and says, give me your money. And the guy said, hey, buddy, you don't know who you're dealing with. I'm a U.S. senator. And the guy says, then give me my money. Praise <laughs> 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 the Lord. <laughs> See, we, we have to hear him in order to understand his words, to understand his love, to understand his mercy, to understand his grace, his declaration that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. 2 Corinthians 3.6. about to wrap up here. 2 Corinthians 3.6. A couple more scriptures. Praise the Lord. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. What, what is the ministry of the New Testament? Healing the sick. It's spreading the good news, but it's healing the sick, casting out demons, raising the dead. Jesus is not what Jesus told us to do after he left, right? So he has made us able to do that. Yes. Not the letter, but the Spirit. Yes. Not just reading the stuff on the page, but actually operating by the Spirit of God. For the letter kills. And we know that it does. Any of us that have lived under a religious environment know that the letter just, it's, it kills you. It kills the desire to even try to do anything because you know you're going to fail. And if you don't know it, they'll be sure to point it out to you. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. It quickens. It makes you alive. See, without the author which is the Spirit of God, to interpret His Word for us, the Bible becomes a dividing wall, which is exactly what Jesus dealt with and all the apostles in that first century church. Yeah, yeah. One that they had a different Bible, it was they had a different belief in it, a different understanding of it. Right. So again, look at John 5, 39 and 40 again. You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. Or God's life. But they're talking about me. Search the scriptures. Let me think you have eternal life. Then they will testify to me. And you won't, but you won't come to me that you can have this life. Mm -hmm. See, the challenge for us, the challenge for us today is take the Bible seriously. Yes. Yes. Believe it. Yes. Personally experience it. The way God proclaims it. Yes, Lord. To know in the reality of our daily living that he is with us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. Amen. That his attributes are there for us. That his provision is there for us. His protection is there for us. His deliverance is there for us. And it's functioning now. This minute yes. in our life. Yes. Ephesians 4. 13 through 23. This is, I really am, not lying. I'm almost done. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 4, 13 through 23. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, make an increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. <clears throat> this I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind. Having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's in them 
because of the blindness of their heart. Now, I've said some crude things about idiots and morons, but look, I'm, I'm using biblical language here, folks. <laughs> Who, being past feeling, have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Is that not the world that we're looking at today, even the religious world? But you have not so learned Christ. That isn't how we learned it. If so that you have heard him and have been taught by him or by the Spirit. In other words, you didn't learn it that way. You're not operating that way. Why? Because you learned this by the Spirit itself, by Jesus. As the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust or the ignorant way of thinking. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Yes. Praise the Lord. Then, this, I, I haven't heard this song for a long time, but I thought about it the other morning. Then we can actually sing the old song with honesty. You ask me how I know he lives. Yeah. He lives in my heart. Amen. I know it. Right. Even if I can't explain it, even if I can't get you to believe it, I know it because he lives in me. He is one with me. So then, inspired by the work of the past, Encouraged by the promises that he's given us for the future. Mm -hmm. Let's live. Let's walk with him now. Yeah. And we'll see the devil is defeated. And we are victorious. Mm -hmm. Last scripture, Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Praise the Lord. Yeah. For in him yes. we live and move and have our being. Yes. As certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. Yeah. Hallelujah. That is truth that needs to be conscious in our minds all the time. Amen. And I believe that's what God is doing in this last day. The revelation we've gotten over the last 10 years that have changed most of our lives is just minuscule compared to what God is wanting to reveal to us. That's right. As we awaken presence in our lives, his ongoing moment to moment existence yes. with us Amen. and in us. Can you say praise the Lord? Praise praise the Lord. Lord. Give him a hand this morning. Praise Lord. Lord. Glory to God. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for your patience. Let's just, let's, it's not complicated. It just takes a little bit of discipline. That discipline is, thank him. Thank him, not me. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Hope to see you back here Friday for Eastern Gatehouse of Prayer.